So, question of the day. Why is it that we cook brisket to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, but we cook steak medium rare to around 135 degrees Fahrenheit? And for that matter, why do we cook turkey to 170 degrees Fahrenheit? For me, this question came up recently in kind of an unusual context, that of roasting a goose. Now, roasting a goose is, I would say, a highly unusual culinary experience, not only because not very many people do it anymore, but also more particularly because, unlike other poultry, you don't cook goose to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Instead, you cook the goose, or at least you cook the goose breasts, to 135 degrees Fahrenheit, or medium rare. And when I roasted a goose for the first time, that's exactly what I did. I roasted it to 135 degrees Fahrenheit and cut off the breasts and then continued cooking the legs to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. And at least as far as the breasts were concerned, that was exactly the right way to do it. The meat was tender, succulent, just like a strip of steak. The legs, however, left something to be desired. The meat was delicious, yes, but it also seemed just a little bit more tough and perhaps even rubbery than I thought it should be. Now, fortunately, I had a second goose. And so with that second goose, I could cook the legs to a different temperature and see if there was any kind of a difference. But the question was, what temperature should I cook it to? Should I be cooking the legs medium rare, like the breasts? Should I be cooking them to 200 degrees, like a pulled pork or like a brisket? Was I overcooking it or was I undercooking it? Of course, asking those questions leads inevitably to the question of why we cook any meat to any particular temperature in the first place. So without further ado, here are some of the answers to those questions and also how they affected my decisions about what I did with my second goose. So let's start with chicken and turkey because those are easiest and then I will move on to red meats. For chicken and turkey, usually the recommendation is at about 165 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take, depending on the source. The motivation behind that temperature range is essentially food safety. That's the temperature range necessary to kill salmonella. Now, you may be wondering why poultry like chicken and turkey need to be cooked to 165 degrees Fahrenheit for food safety reasons, but red meat like pork or beef do not. The answer basically comes down to the relative densities of the two meat types. Red meats like pork and beef are denser and they don't permit the bacteria to penetrate all the way into the muscle. By contrast, the meat tissue of chicken and turkey is much less dense and the bacteria can penetrate all the way to the center of the muscle. That's why we don't eat chicken medium rare, but we do eat beef medium rare. Okay, now on to red meat. So why do we cook steak medium rare, but we cook brisket well done? And the same question for pork chops and a pork shoulder. In the case of red meats like pork and beef, the answer has very little to do with food safety and much more to do with the quality and the texture of the meat. Let's start with why steak is cooked medium rare. The reason why we cook steak medium rare, and of course you can also eat steak rare or medium or even well done, but the reason why steak is generally cooked in that range of being medium rare has to do with what happens around that temperature band. Medium rare is 135 degrees Fahrenheit and at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, the meat begins to denature. That is, the muscle fibers in the meat contract and begin to expel water. The consequence of that, of course, is that the meat dries out and becomes tasteless. So essentially, whenever you cook red meat above 140 degrees Fahrenheit, for every additional degree that you heat it, you are losing moisture and flavor and getting nothing in return. And since the risk of bacteria is somewhat less with red meats than with poultry, you can afford to do that. You can afford to cook your steak at a core temperature of 135 degrees, be reasonably safe, and have flavorful, moist meat. Okay, now let's talk about brisket and similar cuts. Why is it that we cook brisket to 200 degrees? Why is it that when people do a brisket for the 4th of July or for some other holiday, they have to slave over the smoker for 8 to 12 hours? Why can't they just cook it to 135 degrees? The answer, again, has little to do with food safety, but everything to do with meat quality. To understand why, let's take two paradigmatic examples. Say, for example, a filet mignon cut from the tenderloin of a cow, and then the brisket, which is the pectoral muscle of the cow. Filet mignon is a cut which comes from the tenderloin of the cow, and the tenderloin of the cow, and by the way, you have a tenderloin too, which is kind of a fun fact, the tenderloin of a cow is a muscle that gets almost no work. When the cow is alive, the tenderloin is just not used for anything. As a consequence, and as the name tenderloin suggests, 
the muscle fibers there remain remarkably tender. Now let's contrast that with the brisket, which is the pectoral muscle of the cow. Now the pectoral muscles of the cow get a lot more work than the tenderloin does. They're used a lot more. They carry something like 60% of the cow's weight, all day, every day. One of the consequences of that heavy workload is that the individual muscle fibers become sheathed in a protein called collagen. That, together with another protein called elastin, is what is generally referred to when we talk about connective tissue in a piece of meat. And from a culinary perspective, this collagen is almost nothing but trouble. It's tough. It's gristly. It's rubbery. It's chewy. It's everything you don't want when you bite into a meal. For that reason, brisket was considered for a long time to be a very low-quality cut of meat. At some point, however, there was a method discovered that could turn this low-quality cut of meat into a remarkably tender cut of meat. And again, this will have everything to do with the temperature bands that you're cooking the piece of meat in. At around 160 degrees Fahrenheit, something remarkable and important begins to happen to the collagen. The collagen begins to dissolve and break apart and becomes gelatin. Generally, briskets are cooked to around 200 degrees or 205 degrees, and during that whole process, from 160 degrees to 200 degrees, the collagen is slowly dissolving breaking down and turning into liquid gelatin. Now, the really cool thing about this process is that remember, if you cook a brisket up past 140 degrees, as you should, that denaturing process begins at 140 degrees. At 140 degrees, the muscle fibers are contracting. They're expelling water. The muscle is becoming less flavorful, less tender. However, starting at 160 degrees, the collagen begins to dissolve into gelatin, and it works as a counteracting process to that denaturing process. Although the denaturing process expels water from the muscle fibers, the dissolving collagen, which becomes gelatin, remoistens the muscle and keeps it tender and flavorful. Of course, it also helps that many of the cuts of meat that we cook to 200 degrees, like a pork shoulder or a brisket, are also very fatty cuts of meat. And as the temperature rises, the fat begins to render and continues to add moisture and flavor to the meat. So as a brisket ascends up through the temperature range from 140 degrees to 200 degrees, it first loses moisture, then regains moisture, loses moisture through the denaturing process, then gains moisture as fat renders and as collagen dissolves into gelatin. In the case of a cut like a filet mignon, you gain nothing by going above 140 degrees. However, in the case of a cut like a brisket, you first lose a little bit of moisture but then you gain additional tenderness and additional moisture by bringing it above the 140 degree temperature range, above the 160 degree temperature range, all the way up to 200, 205 degrees. And although I've used the examples of filet mignon and brisket specifically here, this is a good general rule of thumb for virtually any cut of red meat. If the cut of meat in question is something like a rump roast or a chuck roast that comes from a part of the cow that was well used, some muscle that was used frequently by that cow, that bore a lot of weight and did a lot of work, then that cut of meat is going to be full of connective tissue, it's going to be full of collagen, and you want to bring it up to that 160 to 200 degree range for some period of time to allow that connective tissue to dissolve into gelatin. By contrast, if you have a cut of meat from a cow, or I suppose also from a pig, that is much less used, and the filet mignon, the tenderloin, is the paradigmatic example here, but of course steak generally falls into this category, there's not going to be much connective tissue there, and so again, every degree that you take it above 140 degrees is moisture and flavor lost with really nothing in return. Medium rare in that case, or whatever your taste is, is the way to go. Now, with all that behind us, we're ready to try to answer the question of how I should cook the legs of my second goose. What is the muscle tissue of a goose like? Is it full of connective tissue? Is it fatty? Did it do a lot of work for the goose? Or is it more like the tenderloin of a cow, a muscle that really never had to do anything and pretty much only exists to be delicious? A comparison can be made here to the legs of a turkey or chicken. Most cooking recommendations say that you should cook turkey or chicken breast to around 165 degrees, as I said, but they recommend cooking the legs to a slightly higher temperature. And the reason for that is, again, not a food safety reason, but a meat quality reason. Bringing it up to a slightly higher temperature will allow a little bit more of the connective tissue to dissolve. If you stop and think about it, a chicken or turkey's legs are going to be used, you know, a fair amount. They're bearing the weight of the bird, they're carrying the bird around all day, they seem much more like the brisket than they do like the tenderloin. So, faced with a choice of cooking the legs either medium rare, 135 degrees, or else very, very well done, up to 200 or 205 degrees like a brisket, the answer seems to be, well, 
It's probably a very well-worked muscle. It probably has a fair amount of connective tissue, and it's also slightly fattier than the breast. Probably the right thing to do is to cook it to the higher temperature, treat it like a brisket. So that is exactly what I did with the second goose. Now, most of the cooking process was exactly the same as the first goose in terms of fat removal and seasoning. The key difference came after I had already heated the goose to 135 degrees Fahrenheit and removed the breasts. Once the breasts were removed, I put the rest of the goose back into the roasting oven and left it to come up to 200 or 205 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm putting the two geese here side by side so that you can see the difference between the two temperatures. On the left is the goose that I cooked to 170 degrees Fahrenheit, and on the right is the goose that I cooked to 200 degrees Suffice it to say that the more well-cooked goose was far, far easier to take apart, whereas with the first goose, I was often wrenching, pulling, and straining myself, and often having to use a knife or scissors in order to take it apart. With the second goose, I very rarely had to use any kind of sharp instrument, and really, for the most part, it just fell apart in my hands. Not only that, but the meat itself was much more tender and easy to pull apart. Of course, the first goose also benefited in part from the process of breaking down collagen into gelatin. It was cooked to 170 degrees Fahrenheit, which is above the 160 degree threshold that allows the collagen to begin breaking down. Bringing the second goose up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit allowed a greater amount of time inside of that heat window that allows the collagen to break down into gelatin, and from there, a better final product. Overall, I would say that cooking the goose to 170 degrees was not bad, but that 200 degrees, in my judgment, is certainly better. And that's my recommendation to you, in case you, you know, just happen to have a goose lying around and you're not sure exactly what temperature to cook it to. Even after all that, however, I still have some lingering questions about what temperature different meats should be cooked to. For example, would chicken or turkey legs benefit from being cooked to 200 degrees like the goose legs benefited from being cooked to 200 degrees? Of course, doing that would require removing the turkey roast from the oven halfway through, cutting off the breasts once they reach their proper temperature, and then putting the legs back in the oven to come up to 200 degrees. Even if 200 degrees is better for turkey legs, it might not be worth that extra effort. Even so, I wonder how much, or if at all, chicken legs or turkey legs would benefit from being brought up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. There's also something very odd about the fact that you cook goose breast to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember, geese actually do use their wings, unlike chickens or turkeys. They're migratory birds and the breast muscles that power the wings and do all that work should, in theory, be relatively full of connective tissue. Yet in the case of geese, they're not. Overall, however, the correlation between a well-worked muscle being cooked to a higher temperature and a less worked muscle being cooked to a lower temperature does seem to hold. It's a good example of a rule that has some exceptions, but is still a good rule. If you know of some other exceptions to that rule, I'd be curious to hear about them in the comments below. And overall, I hope you found the video interesting and that the heuristic that I gave will help some of you to have a better experience while cooking. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.